Welcome back to uh, more AC theory studies. Yeah. Well, what did we do last time we were here? Well, we looked at AC theory, of course, alternating current, and we saw how it uh, worked with resistive loads, like a light bulb. Voltage and current both in phase with each other. Beautiful resistive loads. Then we threw in these inductive loads. Well, this here is a little motor, same motor we had before, but can I really have a pure inductor? Well, we did theoretically in some of our homework in that, but in reality, these coils in here made up of turns and turns of wire. I don't know, there's probably a hundred foot or more of wire inside this thing. So it's really kind of like a series RL, resistance and inductive in part of this load. So we'll see more of how they react. And then I've got a little, uh, little capacitor here, a little switch so we can easily turn it on and off. And we're gonna see what happens now when we put these capacitors and the inductive loads and the light bulbs all together. So let's look at the meter and see what happens. To refresh our memory, let's look at a little light bulb. Nice little resistive load. We'll turn that on. And what do I have? 0.8 of an amp. Now let's look at the scope. Uh, we'll have to see it where we see volts and amps here. Voltage is the higher sine wave, amps is the lower. But look at that, right in phase with each other. Cross and zero, peaking, cross and zero again, going negative at the same time. A beautiful resistive load. And since we got vectors, let's take a look at them. And what do we have here? The dark one is the voltage vector. Most meters will use voltage as a reference. And the little arrowhead in there is the current. And what do we expect? Them right in line. It's a resistive load. Voltage and current should be in phase. They're showing a one degree angle. That's close enough for us. Okay, now let's take a look at our trusty old uh, motor here. We had the same motor when we started our AC studies. And let's plug it in here. We'll go back to uh, menu because we want to get the volt of the amps on it first. Let's look at this. 1.4 amps, turn the light off, that's just the motor. 1.4 amps, not a problem. Let's turn that off. Let's look at the capacitor. I'll turn the capacitor on, see what it draws. 1.3 amps, okay? So the motor is 1.4, this is 1.3. What we remember from adding inductors with resistors and capacitors with resistors is they didn't add up using straight math. They had this vectoral math, the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So let's see what happens when I put a 1.4 amp inductive load. Now there is inductance and resistance, right? The coils in this provide the inductance and the resistance is the hundreds of feet of wire, right? These uh, little coils in there, hundreds of feet of wire in this thing, all wrapped up real tight. So it really has a little resistance in it as well. But 1.4 amps here and 1.3 here. If I have them both on, what happens? Turn the motor on, there's one four, one five, it'll settle down to one four in a moment. But if I add the capacitor, I have them both on and it went down to 0.7 amps. Just the motor, one four. Just the capacitor, one three. Put them both on, I got 0.7. Let's look at the uh, scope on these guys. Oh, let's move it over and get some current in there with it. Current's looking a little wavy. That's from my capacitor. We're not going to get into that now. But it's in phase now, isn't it? I got them both on. If I just had the motor on, it's out of phase. Voltage leading the current, Eli. That's an inductive load. If I turn the motor off and just have the capacitor on, suddenly the current is leading the voltage. That's ice. Current comes before the voltage in capacitive loads. But when I put the two together, they look almost resistive. The voltage and the current are crossing zero and peaking at the same time and crossing zero going negative same time. So let's see what happens if I uh, look at the vectors on these things. Let's turn them both off for now. 
Well, look at the vectors, right? My voltage is steady. That's my reference. The little arrow is jumping around. It doesn't really know where to go. There's really no current flowing. But let's turn on just the uh, motor. The voltage is here. Voltage leads and the current is lagging back. Now, we understood that an inductor should be 90 degrees back. Its current should be 90 degrees back from the voltage behind. But it's only 60. Why is that? Well, because we essentially have a series load here of an of a inductance and a resistance. So the resistance is pulling it back, but it's mostly inductive here. Let's look at the capacitor. Let that sort out. What happened here? My voltage stayed at zero, but my current flowing to my capacitor is 90 degrees ahead. And that's what we expect from a capacitor. For there's, what, a couple of feet of wire here. No wire worth anything. It's mostly just a capacitor, so no resistance on that. And we got a full 90 degrees phase angle. So if we put the two together, the one pointing up, the other pointing at an angle down, turn them both on and they line each other up and the current goes down right if I just have the motor going the currents 1.4 and out of phase if I just have the capacitor the current is 1.3 amps and out of phase but when I turn them both on it goes in phase and the current drops below what either of them is individually. So what we're seeing here is we can actually add a load and reduce the overall current. We're going to go back out to the whiteboard and take a quick look at what's going on with this that the one cancels out the other. Here at the whiteboard, I have a bunch of triangles and some vectors. Triangles are as we've seen them in the past. The vectors have something that's a little different. I'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, let's remember that in series, we had ohmic triangles and there were three different things where, where, that we used ohms to measure. Resistance was on the resistor, obviously. The reactants, XL, uh, inductive reactance was on the inductor and capacitive reactance was how the capacitor reacted. Both of the reactive components reacting to whatever frequency the sine wave was applied to the circuit. And the vector addition of uh, resistance and reactance, whether capacitive or inductive, resulted in my impedance. All of those were oppositions all measured in ohms. And each component had a voltage drop. And in series, we had ohms and volts, and we had power. Both types of circuits had power. Now, we didn't have current triangles because the current is the same and in phase in all parts of the series circuit. Over in parallel, we had current vectors and triangles, and we had power. We didn't have voltage vectors, uh, uh, triangles, because all the voltage vectors are in line, right? The voltage is the same on all the branches and in phase, as was the current in the series. So we have currents that either lead or lag, depending if they're capacitive or inductive, that whole Eli, the Iceman kind of thing. Uh, but where's the ohmic values here? The impedance. Remember this, we know parallel circuits the overall circuit impedance has to be less than the resistive, or as we'll find out here, than the total reactive. But we're used to the total circuit impedance or total circuit ohms being less than that of the branches. But we can't really use a triangle for that because by definition, the hypotenuse has to be longer. So. To find our impedance here, we had two choices. We would either use the formulas for impedance, there were a couple different types, or we would find our total circuit current 
the vector addition of the resistive and the reactive currents. Get the total current, compare that with the applied voltage using Ohm's law, and get our impedance. Now, how does this all relate to that motor? Well, let me show you something different about these vectors, and then I'll show you how the motor and the capacitor we showed earlier, a, a, a simplification of how that worked. What we're doing here, because in RLC, we're putting the resistors with both the inductors and the capacitors, all three components, what we end up with is the resistive, as we know, is in phase. Its voltage and current are in phase. The capacitive in series, its voltage lag, and the inductor's voltage lead, which put these two voltages of the reactive components, the inductor and capacitor, directly opposing each other. So what do we do when we have that? It's like taking 10 steps north and five steps back south again. I just take the little vector and take it away from the big one because they oppose each other. And I'm left with a difference, which that can then be added vectorally using Pythagoras with my resistive voltage to get the total. Same for the ohms. But the main thing is I just take the little vector away from the big one and I'm left with a net reactive voltage, or using the ohm values, a net reactance. Over in the parallel, my currents. I have a resistive current, I have an inductive current, and a capacitive current. If I have one vector that's smaller of the two opposing each other, take it here, subtract it from the big one, and that's my net reactive current that the circuit needs to provide. We'll go into that in more detail, but this is the basic principle that we're adding in this next class when we put all three components together. Let's take a quick look at the motor's vectors. Now, the motor, because we know it has an inductive component and a resistive component, part of the current going through the motor is resistive and part is inductive. So this is a little bit of an oversimplification of what we did, but it gets the point across. The motor is made up of a resistive current and an inductive current, which basically gave it a, a net current that looked like this. Remember, on the meter, the voltage was the reference, and the current for the motor wasn't hanging straight down. It was kind of down 60 degrees, 60 plus degrees, okay? But the capacitor, pointed straight up 90, because it was just capacitance. There's no resistance in that. It was fully 90 degrees out of phase from the voltage. So we're really adding this vector and the motor's vector. Now let's simplify the motor's vector to have its two components. And how do we add these three? These two happen to be about the same length, so they cancel each other out, leaving me just the resistive component. So where I had had 1.3 amps for the capacitor, 1.4 amps for the motor alone in its angular vector, the vertical components canceled each other out, leaving me just the resistive part, which was less than either one on its own. That's the basic thing we're getting to on these RLC circuits. Again, I'll reiterate the key point. The inductive vector and the capacitive vector, whichever variety, will oppose each other. So again, it's like walking north 10 steps and walking south again a few steps. We just take the difference between the two as our total reactive voltage, total reactance, or total reactive current. And then add that vectorally, Pythagorasly, to any resistive component if there is.